Good morning. Welcome to the class this morning. This is uh, Spiritual Warfare Class 004A. Your notes may say something different. I think it still had a 003 uh, on some of the notes. Uh, this is uh, the SCL, the Secret of the Christian Spiritual Life, Lessons 17 and 18 this morning. And we'll begin with a moment of silent prayer. Father Yahweh, we are grateful for your love for us, for your plan of salvation for us, for your eternal purpose for us, and for your word that we might study it and learn more about all of these things and grow closer to you through it. We ask that you bless it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're uh, still in diagrams. You're going to either love or get sick of diagrams because Diagrams are the way that you'll think when these things come up, and uh, everything that we do will be based on diagrams when we get to the specifics. When you, when you learn what, what meekness is and what uh, goodness is and what self-control is and what lasciviousness is, when you learn what those are, you'll be learning them with the diagrams because the diagrams are where you can place those things, good or bad, the vices or the virtues, in the proper perspective in your thinking process so that you can then visualize immediately, immediately. It's like any, any skill, it has to be practiced. And so uh, the more you know the uh, diagrams, when you can, when you can actually diag draw these diagrams from memory yourself and label them completely, then you'll be thinking with the doctrine that the diagrams will contain. So that's the whole purpose of it. That's why we spend, are going to spend a lot of time, uh, two or three lessons. We've already spent, what, a couple of lessons. This is uh, number three, and then we'll spend another lesson probably on diagrams. Uh, I'm going to give you a little taste of what, what it's like today. If we get that far through the slides, hopefully we will. And, uh, but I'm going to start with a quote uh, that I spoke last week, the capacity of the filling in your spirit by the Holy Spirit is based on the size of the vessel constructed from God's word in your soul. So uh, that comes from Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, coupled with Colossians 3.16, the parallel verse, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Those are parallel verses. In one, we see it's be filled with the Spirit. In the other, it is let the Word of God dwell in you richly, which tells us that it is the Word of God dwelling in us uh, and in large capacity that will facilitate the filling of the Spirit. And that's why I came up with that, with that statement. And uh, it'll be uh, a guiding statement. I'm still, still pondering that statement for to make it a little, a little less wordy and a little more clear, uh, but we'll work with that and we'll get it down. But that's really the key. The more word you have, the more filling you have. That, that, that's probably the easiest way to say it. The more word you have, the more filling you may have. You don't automatically get the filling, but you have to get the word. The filling is not your work. The filling is the work of the Holy Spirit, but he fills based on that capacity uh, that's de developed from the quantity of the word of God in you. Okay, so let's look at a diagram. This diagram is uh, one that we introduced last week. Get my water out of the way there. It's one that we... Uh, worked with last week, and let's talk about it. It begins with the event. Events happen all the time. Events can be something from 
a knock at the door, to uh, a conversation, to a, uh, something that comes on the TV, the radio, whatever, uh, to something uh, said by someone. That's an event. But that event goes by unnoticed until you perceive that event. And that's the second aspect here in our diagram. First, uh, events. Events happen continuously. I mean, uh, there's almost no time that events don't happen. And uh, even when you're asleep, events are happening, but you have no perception of them when you're asleep, uh, actually physically asleep, but you also don't have any cognition of them if you're asleep mentally as well. So we have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to be aware of what's going on. And in our context, we have to be aware of the word and we need to have plenty of opportunity and plenty of utilization of that opportunity to understand the perception of the events because you have filters. Perception, uh, let's just do it this way. You're aware. Okay. The appraisal filters uh, we're going to cover in greater depth today uh, so that you'll understand them. You'll uh, recall that I think I gave you, mentioned to you the uh, acronym SAMBAC, stands for self uh, concept, self concept, attitude, mood, beliefs attribution, and knowledge. Now, I've taken this appraisal process from several different psychology uh, documents and books, and so on, and I've distilled it down to just simplified for us. We don't need 19 pages of, of psychological jargon uh, to understand all of this. It's just nice and simple, and I picked the the primary major categories of the appraisal filters with the sandbags. All right, so once you appraise a situation, then you create a representation. And the representation is basically what the filters have told you about this particular uh, situation, this particular event that you have now perceived. So then from the representation, you now have to make a make a decision about this. And we'll see uh, what, how we base decisions. Uh, also, I think that's going to come up next week because uh, I don't want to give you too many acronyms and too many of these things all in the same class. So I think next week you're going to see uh, the emotional and the cognitive uh, methods that we come up with a final representation when we when we determine with that representation what we're going to do with it and there are two things that can happen you can have a cognitive response or an emotional reaction okay now this this is the uh, unbeliever we we'll call him the unbe or the believer out of fellowship i call them the boofs okay believer out of fellowship a believer walking in the flesh, walk, not walking by means of the spirit. A boof, believer out of fellowship. All right? So that's one walking in the old man. That's the other way we could put it. And some of these diagrams will have the old man in here. So we either cognitively deal with the situation or we emotionally react. That's, that's our dilemma. And that happens in the volitional interlude. Now, if you, if you handle it with the cognitive response, the unbeliever or the believer out of fellowship, you're going to do, uh, end up with choosing human good most of the time, most of the time. Um, but if you react with the emotional uh, in your volitional interlude, then you're going to be shifting over to human bad. You're going into the sinful category. Uh, and so that's, 
essentially what you can get from this first diagram, that events happen, you become aware of it, you sandbag it, come up with a representation, then make a decision, uh, either cognitive or emotional, and that produces either human good or human bad. Okay, we'll get, you'll see more of these diagrams as we, as we move along. Uh, we'll cover, cover it from several different aspects. Here it is in the believer that I mentioned that we would cover. So here's the believer. An event happens. You become aware of the event. You perceive it. You appraise it. Now, your appraisal will be sandback and divine viewpoint. Divine viewpoint. So what is divine viewpoint? Divine viewpoint is the categorical doctrine you have stored in your soul to evaluate things, to appraise them. Remember what it says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, he who is spiritual appraises all things. He who is spiritual appraises all things. Now, people say, oh, no, it's, it, the Bible says you shall not judge. Well, that's different. That judging is judging for condemnation. That's finding fault with people, things, uh, where appraisal is evaluating. So you can use the word uh, appraisal or evaluation. And divine viewpoint is the alternative that we have as believers walking by means of the spirit, as you'll see here. If we appraise with the divine viewpoint, then you come up with a representation then that representation is cycled through your soul. We'll see that in other diagrams. Cycled through your soul, and then you get to the volitional interlude to where you're going to transfer it to your heart. And you're going to either choose the new man response or the old man reaction. And if you choose the new man response, you'll produce and maintain spirituality. But if you choose the old man, you will walk in carnality, the sarks, the flesh. Okay? Is that clear enough? So, so it all boils down to how you appraise things and, and the representation that you make. And that is determined by the sandbag. So we'll cover the sandbags in pretty good detail, not not ultimate detail, but a pretty good uh, amount of information about them. And then what you do with that in your mind and transferring it to your heart at the volitional interlude to either do the new man response or the old man response or an old man reaction that determines whether you are spiritual or carnal. All right, here is that diagram in your notes for blank, and that's to allow you, not right now, but allow you to go ahead and fill it in when, uh, as part of your homework assignment. So you see there's an event, if you watch your computer screens or the, or the uh, presentation screen, event, perception, appraisal. Appraisal is either sandback or divine viewpoint. That appraisal results in a representation and then in the volitional interlude, it's either the inherited genetic human nature from Adam response or the reservoir of righteousness response of the spiritual life, the doctrine that you have stored in your soul, which determines whether it becomes works or it becomes fruit. Works or fruit. Okay. All right, now we're going to cover appraisal filters. I guess I actually should have shown you that last uh, process there. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and show you that last process there. Or did you see it? You saw it where where the things uh, appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I I did. So you don't need this one now. 
uh, you be, you'll be able to fill it out. You'll be able to complete it. And, and when you can do it from memory, as I said, you're understanding the process and understanding that process will give you, okay, this has all the builds, each stage of what I just did in this one, okay. Okay, there's all the builds that you see and it ends with either works coming out of the inherited human nature or fruit coming out of the reservoir of righteousness. Can I get another amen? Amen. Okay, so next we're going to cover the appraisal factors. These are the appraisal factors in your appraisal filter. And, and what I want you to do is, is when we talk about appraisal filters, I want you to think of these coffee filters, okay? And uh, each of the coffee filters uh, will have a designation from one of these majors, the inner circle here in this diagram, mood, attribution, attitude, knowledge, self-concept, uh, and beliefs, okay? Those are the filters. Now, each of those filters, uh, except attribution, has uh, two or three uh, subcategories that we'll cover that help explain them to make them more clear. So if you have, uh, if you have six coffee filters and a Sharpie, you can write down in that coffee filter, you can write uh, self-concept, attitude, uh, mood, beliefs, attribution, and knowledge in each one of them. You can have one for each. And then if you want, you can actually write in the secondaries that we'll cover. And when you do that, uh, you'll, you will remember them, okay? Uh, it's part of how memory works. And you will remember them much better if you do that process. And uh, you can still use them for coffee filters because the, there's nothing chemical about uh, the, uh, the Sharpie uh, ink, okay? It's, it's organic. Uh, and it's actually health food, so don't worry about uh, your coffee filters, okay? All right, so let's cover. Let's cover. Uh, how do we end up with that one again? Okay. All right, let's cover the appraisal filters. As an introduction to those appraisal filters, I'm going to repeat the resistance to temptation that we covered previously. Resistance is the action of opposing something that you disapprove or disagree with. We're on slide six now. Uh, to resist, the verb to oppose actively and with force. Idioms are to mount, offer resistance, or put up a fight, or stand up to, or against. Okay? So... Resist means to oppose actively and with force. Here's how, I'll give you an example that's not a sinful thing, but is, a, is an example that people can relate to because it's such a common, common thing in, uh, in our society or has been in the past. And that's uh, someone who wants to quit smoking. Okay, They want to quit smoking. Um, so they... Uh, carry a pack of cigarettes around with them. Uh, had one, uh, one patient that uh, actually carried a cigarette around in his mouth all the time till the, till the tobacco was so dried up it, and the paper on the cigarette would fall out, fall off. But that was his way of resisting the temptation to smoke. Other people have to completely get rid of their cigarettes, may have to do it with some sort of a ceremony. You know, they may, they may take their 
their uh, cigarettes. I know of one lady who, who took the cigarettes and said, you are never going to control my life again and crushed them up and threw them in the garbage. Okay. Or some people take this, every cigarette and break it and put it in the garbage. Some, in some way to resist with force, with force. And that's what we want to do when we are tempted to commit a sin. One of the things that we'll cover in Ephesians is that we want to resist it with force. We don't want to be like the person who's trying to quit, who says, well, I, I really would like to quit smoking. I, I really want to. And, uh, and, and the other part of their brain says, uh, the part that's become accustomed to the nicotine says, yeah, but it sure would feel good, wouldn't it? So, well, no, I really, I, I, I'm trying to quit. Yeah, but you know what it does for you, how, make, how it makes you feel. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Well, okay, I'll have another cigarette, okay? You know, that's not resisting with force. That's arguing with yourself. And when I counsel people who were trying to quit smoking, I always told them, Never argue with yourself. Never argue with yourself when you're tempted to sin either. Never argue with yourself. Say, no, that's it. In the case of the cigarette smoker, no, I don't smoke. In the case of sins, no, I don't watch that kind of program. No, I don't read that book. I don't, I don't look at that movie. I don't listen to people talking that way. Whatever it is, you have to refuse it. Uh, in, your, in your margin there where it says resist, right? Refuse. I refuse to do that. Refuse to accept that. Okay? That's, that's what it means to resist. And it can't be wishy-washy. It has to be forceful. Temptation is a solicitation to express independence from God through violation of his standards or will. Violation of his standards or will. It's a solicitation. Remember, we're going to see, we're going to see James again. I gave you a brief version of James uh, a couple of lessons ago and when we talked about temptation. We're going to see it again because the only way you will learn these things is it's through repetition. Through repetition, you have to be able to coordinate them one thing with another. Temptation is a solicitation to express independence from God through violation of his standards or will. I developed this definition because I wanted to emphasize the fact that this is expressing independence from God, which no believer wants to do. So therefore, this helps to remind you, uh oh, this is not just a sin. This is me expressing my independence from God. Now it becomes another level. Well, what does it matter if I uh, do this or do that? Well, when you add the, oh, what does it matter if I express my independence from my Father, Heavenly Father, by doing this? Then it brings it home to you more clearly than just the, the act of, of um, drinking too much or, or uh, watching some program, something. Uh, uh, but when you add that independence from God uh, factor, I think it gives it more meaning for us. There are three components necessary to resistance. Number one, you have to understand temptation. You understand temptation through divine viewpoint, through doctrinal orientation, on having enough Bible stored in your memory center and categorical centers in your heart. Okay? Doctrinal orientation. I know how temptation works. I know that this is temptation, the 10 steps. Now you're, you're not, uh, and hopefully, and we'll probably cover it again, just because I'd like to do those kind of things to you. Uh, the 10 steps, most of those steps aren't gonna be a problem to you, but some of them are going to be your weak spots. So those are the ones you should have memorized. You don't have to memorize all 16 aspects of, of it. No, let's see, that's uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
14 aspects of the 10 steps. But the ones that are significant for you, the ones that give you the most trouble, you should have those so that when you're in a situation, you can say, oops, this is approximation. All right. oh, this is conversation. This is, uh, this is um, what's another one? I'm trying to think of one that might not be a problem for me. Uh, uh, this, this is uh, rationalization. Okay. Uh, so you need those whichever ones, and there'll be there'll be generally three to five of them that are your major problems. But I gave all ten plus the breakdown of the of the misrepresentation, the misquotation section. There, I gave you all of them, so you could get to know them, and then you'll you'll forget all of them, but don't forget the ones that are weaknesses for you in the process. Recognizing incidences of temptation, that's number two, and that requires spiritual orientation. You have to be walking in the spirit to recognize those incidences of temptation. Now, you can recognize them from memory. You know, even when you're not walking by means of the spirit, you can still uh, see them from memory. Um, that's an area that we'll have to cover in greater detail because that gets into a lot of spiritual warfare stuff that we're not ready for yet. And then the next step, the willpower, the faith to uh, choice to resist. The willpower, the faith choice to resist, that comes from volitional orientation. So you have doctrinal orientation, knowing, spiritual orientation, the power, and volitional orientation, the choosing. Okay, so you can write those down. Doctrinal orientation, the knowing, the word. Spiritual orientation, that's the uh, filling of the spirit, the awareness through the spirit. You want the Holy Spirit to thump you in the back of the head when there's a temptation that you spend more than two seconds considering. Okay. Because temptation comes into your mind, remember? It comes into your mind, and it's, uh, it's there, and it will be there as long as you continue to ruminate on it. That rumination is, that's where arguing with yourself usually comes in. When you're thinking about that temptation, that's generally the 10-step step, step of, of uh, arguing with yourself, debating, okay? Uh, and then the power, the willpower of faith to resist. Remember, God enables us with power. Right? We'll see a, an amazing verse that, that people misquote. They, they'll take the first part of the, of the pericope, of the passage, and they'll say, uh, ah, God has given us all power. And then they leave the last part out, unto patience. You say, wait a minute, I wanted all power to be able to command demons and to be able to, to pray and with power. No, it says, gives us all power unto patience because patience is very important in the process. We'll see that in our future lessons too. So just make a little note, patience will be coming up and it's important. All right, so here is my favorite for understanding temptation. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, the actual uh, Greek says it this way, let, let no individual say when he is tempted to commit sin, I am being tempted to commit sin by God, for God is untemptable. Now, you can't even tempt God because he's so perfect. That's, the, that's our goal. When it says to grow up to the stature of the fullness of Christ, the fully mature Christ, that's where we want to be, where you can't even, can't even be tempted with that area. And you will find that there are areas of your life that there are temptations that you uh, have a big struggle. Uh, but as you, as you learn these steps and you do this frequently enough, it'll get to the point where that doesn't even tempt you anymore. It's not an issue. 
Again, I'll use the analogy of smoking because everybody's aware of either having smoked or knowing someone who smoked and tried to quit or people who quit. When I quit smoking, I'm trying to remember how many years ago, that was a long, long time ago. Wasn't it? Uh, I said, when I get to be 70, I'll start smoking again because it can't kill me that quickly. And I, you know, I'll be old enough to die anyway. So, so then I can enjoy my last year smoking. Well, I'll be what, 74 next, uh, in, in, in a month or yeah, in a month, I'll be 74. And not once has the temptation to start smoking again crossed my soul, okay? That is the most, the most uh, disgusting thing I can think of. Uh, I mean, it's like licking an ashtray full of cigarette butts and ashes. No, but but that's what I said when I quit because I you know because I really enjoyed smoking so I said okay I'll I'll quit for now but when I turn seventy I'm going back to it I'll smoke again uh, because you know I'm not going to have that much longer to live so you know what's the chance it's going to kill me okay all right so here's the corrected translation uh, not even one person that's the Greek word maydays when he is solicited to do evil should say that it is from the ultimate source of God that he is tempted because the God is untemptable by evil and does not tempt any person, udes, notice medes, one person, udes, any person. God does not tempt any person with evil. Okay? So any temptation you have is not a, is not uh, uh, perazzo. I always get my two words for tempting and tempting and testing uh, confused. So, but this is the bad one. This is the temptation to sin. We'll see when, how God tests us. He gives us testing for our momentum in our spiritual growth, but never is it a temptation to sin. Okay. You're not, de you're not developing uh, momentum and spiritual growth by being tempted to sin. So that's why you say this. Uh, it's not from the ultimate source of God to be tempted. All right, verse 14, but each one is tempted. Each one is hekastos, and it's each individual is tempted. That's peirazo, that's the, the solicitation to do evil. And that's, notice it's a present passive indicative. It means it's, it's ongoing. That's the present tense, it's ongoing. Passive, you receive it. You receive the temptation from the outside. Uh, the world, the flesh, or the devil. Uh, indicative, it's a reality. Uh, when he is carried away, at Zelko, uh, and that's for like a, tow, a tugboat towing, uh, pulling something along. Okay, and how, what are we pulled by? By his own lust. By is hupo, the, the uh, preposition of under authority, under the authority of his own, Idios, his own, and it's, it's, it's emphatic. It makes it even more so. Your very own, your personal, your individual lust pattern, your epithumia, your, your own desire pattern, your own lust pattern. And you develop these lust patterns over your lifetime. Uh, you know, a person who, who has a drinking problem has a drinking problem because they've developed the lust pattern, the desire problem, over a course of their lifetime to the point where everything else is blocked out. Common sense goes away because the lust pattern is so strong. Same is true with sex addicts, gambling addicts, uh, drug addicts, everybody who has an, what is called in modern parlance an addiction. What they have done is they have epithumied to the point where it shuts off rational thinking. Okay, And the last one, and enticed. That's daily odzo, and that's bait. That's the story I gave you about the guy that walks six blocks out of his way so he can go by Joe's bar and go in and have too many drinks. Okay, that's the bait. The bait is the, is the beer or the gin and tonic or the whatever it happens to be. <laughs> and it's not, you're not supposed to amen the, the alcohol categories here, okay? Uh, but that's the story 
uh, the uh, bait is, is whatever it is that draws you, okay? It's like bait on a fishing hook. It's like bait in a trap. All right, well, here's part that I didn't cover previously when I gave you those. So we're expanding. I always try to expand, give you more information to build on what you've already had. So verse 15, then when this lust has conceived, then is the word aeta, which means next in, next in the sequence. It's a, it's a sequential thing that happens. When this lust, ho is the definite article for this epithumia, the lust, as we had epithumia in our last slide, this specific lust pattern. So it's talking about a specific lust pattern has conceived. This is sulambano, and it is uh, the term for receive seed. This is the, the word for pregnancy, for for impregnation, I should say, not pregnancy itself, but impregnation. This is, it's, it's very interesting that they understand what, what uh, sperm and eggs do, uh, but receiving seed, that's when the sperm impregnates the ovum, okay? And this is actually James, who was not a physician like Luke was, but he knows this stuff, okay? God reveals it to him. Sulambano receives seed, is impregnated. Okay, so when when lust, when this uh, specific lust pattern has conceived, has been impregnated, it gives birth to sin. And that word birth there should be it conceives sin. It conceives sin. It's ticto. Ticto. It conceives sin. This isn't birth yet. It conceives hamartia, sin. The general term used for sin, meaning to miss the goal, miss the target, miss the bullseye. And this is now the embryo. You had the seed that impregnates and impregnates the egg okay the egg was what the egg was the lust pattern what's the seed that impregnates haven't told you that but you're going to write down in your notes in big letters there uh, probably go back to the slide before uh, to where the impregnated is This one, Sulambano receives seed. Seed is your volition. Seed is your volition. That's what impregnates the lust pattern. The epithumia is impregnated by your volition. The only thing that you have control of in this process, okay? So it conceives then, it, it doesn't give birth to sin, it conceives the sin, an embryo of sin. Um, and that's the general term for missing the mark. And when sin is accomplished, when it, when it reaches full term, is what we say in pregnancies, okay? So the sin is the hamartia, and when accomplished, apotaleo, uh, apotaleo actually, uh, from the ultimate source of its completion at full term, gestation. Okay, this is, a, this is an, an analogy to the pregnancy and birth process. It brings forth, apokueo, it now gives birth to death, thanatos. Now gives birth to death. Remember we covered the seven deaths? So this would be operational death. Uh, one that I call fellowship death. Okay. This is, you can write in, in uh, big letters, it puts you back into the old man. Just write old man, old man walk, old man walk. That's how you get out of the new man walk into the old man walk. 
but you have to understand that the impregnation is your volition, your choice. So then think about this. When is, when is all of this happening up until the impregnation? When is, where is it happening? In your mind. Okay. This is happening in your mind. Okay. So you, all of this goes on until it receives seed, that happens at your volitional interlude. So from our most recent thinking process that we've been looking at diagrammatically, it would be, the representation would be, oh yeah, okay? This lust pattern is, is ready, okay? This lust pattern is ready. I've been, I've been baited. And I've been dragged along by my lust pattern. And now it's at the point where I can make the decision to go through with it. So that's the representation. And I say yes or no at the volitional interlude. That's either I impregnate that, that lust pattern or I abort that lust pattern. And that death is separation from fellowship with God, what we'll call the old man walk. So here's the resistance. This should take place in the mind before the, uh, before the volitional interlude choice. So you recognize the temptation. You have to know what sin is and you have to know uh, that it's in that appraisal process. And then you refuse to entertain the temptation. I use the words, I reject that. I refuse that, depending on the context. I reject that. I refuse that. Okay? That's short-circuiting it. You, you, you immediately then instead of having that temptation running around in your appraisal process, so here's the, the blank diagram here. This is, uh, you, you know, your appraisal process. So you've got that, that uh, lust pattern, that epithumia. Epithumia temptation is in that appraisal process. Well, I want to short circuit it, short circuit it by saying that's temptation. That's my immediate, as soon as I recognize it, that's my, my, uh, uh, how did I give it on this? That's what I gave you on this diagram, didn't it? Represent <laughs> too many, too many uh, synonyms. So in my representation, I say that's temptation. Jump to the volitional interlude and say, no, I reject that. I refuse that. See, that's how you short circuit it. Otherwise, you then you can get into in the ten steps consideration and conversation and. Uh, following the rest of it. So, so we'll, we'll tie these together, the 10 steps and these different diagrams and these things. We'll tie them all together, but you have to know each of them individually in order to be able to see them when they're put together. So, so my appraisal process, I uh, immediately, I say, that's temptation. I short circuit that and I'm going straight to the volitional interlude and I'm saying, no, I, re I refuse that. I reject that. That saves you all those steps, okay? Because in the appraisal process, it might be approximation. It might be in a, putting yourself in a situation where temptation can occur. You say, uh-oh, I'm, I'm at this party and everybody's lighting up their dope. Everybody's lighting up their marijuana. I'd, I should not be here. Now, well, you don't say, well, maybe I can witness to these people when they get high. No, you say, 
you say short shortcut straight to representation, temptation, volitional interlude. I refuse that. Goodbye. Right, right from right from here, yeah, right from the approximation stage. All right. So if you really want to get ahead on these things, you can take your 10 steps diagrams. I think I gave you full size diagrams of that. Uh, and I'll give you full size diagrams of all of these so you can kind of tie them together. We'll do that for next lesson. Um, so that you can see how those, all of those, everything I've taught so far goes together. Okay. And it's just now being able to put it together. And I'm doing some of that for you today. So resisting temptation, know what sin is in the appraisal process. Refuse to entertain it. Make a representation of, uh, that's temptation. Make a volitional interlude of, no, I reject that. Now there's another step here that you haven't had before. Rehearse, notice that these are alliterations, recognize, refuse, and rehearse. Uh, rehearse the appropriate counter doctrine or scripture. Okay. That's, that's super growth when you can do that. When you can say, oh, because the Bible says pharmakia is, in my, everybody's lighting up their joints, uh, pharmakia is a work of the flesh. Okay. There, but that's not the fruit of the spirit. So, so I go to the, to the scripture, the pharmakia. Pharmakia is witchcraft in Galatians uh, and other places, but predominantly in Galatians. And it's a, it's a work of the flesh. Okay. So, so if I say, oh, okay, Galatians uh, 5.17, uh, I think it's 517. I can't remember now. Uh, work of the flesh, witchcraft, pharmakia. Okay. I'm done with that. Okay. And I run it through my mind because that reinforces the word in, and the, in the temptation. It reinforces your, your biblical response to the temptation. Okay. And then that's right here. Okay. I've already given you the epithumia in the uh, appraisal process and the temptation uh, to the volitional interlude. I gave you that. So there it is again. So let's, let's back up. Let me give it to you this way. The event, you're at a party. You find out you're approximated to a bunch of dope heads. Okay. And you become aware of that that everybody is starting to do drugs, okay? Or whatever, wife swap, whatever the, you know, whatever's going on, uh, you perceive that this is not a party for me. I have approximated myself accidentally, hopefully accidentally, to a situation that is, that is conducive to temptation and sin, okay? So you perceive that. So you go through the appraisal and instead of Sam back, you're going to use divine viewpoint. Oh, this is, this is temptation to sin. Uh, that's my representation. My volitional interlude says, not going to choose the inherited genetic human nature of Adam. Uh, I'm going to choose the reservoir of righteousness and resist that and say no. And then I'm going to rehearse the scripture. And it might be in the two examples I gave, it might be pharmakeia, Galatians, it might be lasciviousness or fornication. I'm not going to, I refuse that, I reject that. Okay? So instead of uh, evil works, you, chose, you choose fruit. Okay. So recognition, reckon yourself dead to it. Uh, I did it too. Oh, I didn't realize. I thought it would go one at a time. All right, so let's go get back to it. Okay, what's the process? Recognize, reckon yourself dead to that. Okay, reckon yourself dead to your old nature. That's that's really your representation is your reckoning. 
I reckon myself dead to that. Volitional interlude, I resist that. I refuse that. Those diagrams big enough in the four slides to four slides per page to be able to write in notes like that. Okay. Okay. So what time it be? 1050. We've got still got four hours. Okay. Um, the appra appraisal factors. The appraisal factors. Okay, the inner circle. I start in at about eight o'clock, self-concept. Then I jump uh Across to four o'clock, attitude. I jump up to 12 o'clock, mood. I jump to 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, beliefs. Then I jump across to two o'clock, attribution. And I drop down to six o'clock, knowledge in your diagram. I should have put them in the right order, but when I did these, I didn't, I didn't already have the, the acronym. I came up with that afterwards as a way to be able to remember it, okay? So let's go. Self-concept consists of the self-image and the self-esteem. Self-image and self-esteem. Self-concept or self-identity is the mental notion a person has about his or her physical, psychological, and social attributes, as well as his attitudes, beliefs, and ideas. So self-concept is usually thought of in terms of physical, the self-image. Bulimia is a disease of a, of a <coughs> negative self-image, a negative self-concept, okay? I'm too fat, even though that's skin hanging off my bones, not fat, I'm too fat. So I will not eat anything, or if I do, I'm going to throw it up. That's because of a bad self-concept related to self-image. But it's self-concepts composed of self-image and self-esteem. So physical, psychological, social attributes, attitudes, beliefs, ideas, predominantly physical, psychological, and social attributes. That's where people get it. I'm so stupid. I'm, I'm uh, so ugly. I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm so clumsy in social situations. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to sit home in my bedroom, okay? Not going to do anything else because I'm, I'm not a popular, good person. In psychology, self-esteem is the person's self-image from an emotional level, circumventing reason and logic. The maintenance of a healthy degree of self-esteem is a central task within psychotherapy, where patients often suffer from excess degrees of self-criticism, hampering their ability to function. If you are in self-criticism, you are either depressed or anxious or you are in the downward slide towards negative self-image, self-concept, self-esteem. Popularized in the 70s as the cause of the ills of society, remember that, uh, I'm okay, you're okay, you remember that, and of the individual humans, and written into California, California law was something to oppose low self-esteem rapidly became a universal explanation for any personal failing and a staple target for personal development movements, sometimes resulting in narcissistic, overconfident individuals with excessive self-esteem. Okay. Now, it's my theory, and I'm not going to develop it much now, but I personally don't believe that there's anything like low self-esteem. Nobody, remember, they, you have an ideal self. And people with what we call low self-esteem, their ideal self is wonderful, okay? They think they're great. So this plague I have is not really me. And so I'm an idiot or I'm this or I'm that, okay? It's, and that's what psychology calls low self-esteem. 
when really it's because they think that they're better than they act, better than they look, better than they behave. That's what the person thinks. And when they have to face reality, then they condemn themselves. They, they uh, begin to uh, criticize themselves. Okay. So you had all of the books that tried to overcome this and Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, Yogi and all of those things, you know, you're, you're going to get this better self-image if you just do these things. A person's self-image is a mental picture, generally of a kind that is quite resistant to change, that depicts not only details that are potentially available to objective investigation by others, height, weight, hair color, nature of external genitalia, IQ score, uh, is the person double-jointed, is the person uh, athletic, you know, all those kind of things, but also items that have been learned by that person about himself or herself, either from personal experience or by internalizing the judgments of others. So we have, and, and fortunately it's been brought out in the last few years, we have the social media uh, problem where these young girls, usually early teenage girls, prepubescent or pubescent girls, uh, see all of these beautiful people with wonderful lives posted on Facebook. And they say, well, that's not me. I, I can't, I don't live up to that. I, you know, my teeth aren't perfect. My hair's not perfect. My eyes are not perfectly spaced. I have, my nose is too little or too big. Uh, you know, all of those things. I, I'm not the perfect person. They get depressed that then goes into their self-image and their self-concept is the, is the depression override, what I call the depression override of who they really are. Now, if you look at famous people, uh, I shouldn't say famous, I should say accomplished people, people who have done wonderful things. Uh, I should have some pictures in this presentation of those, but I, since I just kind of got off on this, uh, as an aside, I don't have any prepared, but, but look at Albert Einstein. How many of us want to look like Albert Einstein? How many of us want to be short, balding, frizzy haired, uh, goofy guy? Okay. Why would we want to be that? Well, if that's all you watched on YouTube or on uh, Facebook, you would soon begin to say, well, I'm, that's not me. I don't, I don't. I don't match up. I don't meet the expectations of the world. And so you become depressed and then that, that overrides, that becomes your mental picture that has been internalized by the judgments of others. Now you actually have, uh, and they sell and people use uh, apps that you can glamorize yourself on your, for your Facebook picture. You can take out wrinkles, you can make your lips fuller, you can straighten your teeth, you can uh, put your eyes at the exact perfect symmetrical place, ears symmetrical, body head shape symmetrical, give yourself other endowments uh, that, that make you look good. And, and they're everywhere. People, young girls are using them. I've seen uh, studies of it the Facebook picture of that person and then their real life picture. And, and it's like looking at a uh, Vogue magazine cover and then the actual model uh, without makeup. Uh, they don't look nearly as good as they do in the photograph. Well, the Facebook people, girls don't look nearly as good as they look in real life and they can't accept that. They have to fake their appearance in order to be more appealing Okay, we're all the way to slide 20 out of uh, what, 75 or something. We're not gonna get very far today. All right, so let's see here. Those items include the answers to such questions. Am I skinny? Am I fat? Am I weak? Am I strong? Am I intelligent? Am I stupid? Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Am I a male? Am I a female? And I wrote this in 2006 before the question of am I a male or am I a female was uh, in all of the headlines of today. 
Okay. Overview of self-concept theory for counselors. Uh, this is from uh, the Eric Capps Digest, a psychological uh, counseling uh, uh, resource. After more than a decade of relative neglect, self-concept is enjoying renewed popularity and attention by both researchers and practitioners. There is a growing awareness that all of the perceptions we experience in the course of living, none has more profound significance than the perceptions we hold regarding our own personal existence, our concept of who we are and how we fit into the world. Self-concept may be defined as the totality of a complex, organized, and dynamic system of learned beliefs, attitudes, and opinions that each person holds to be true about his or her personal existence. Good definition. Fromm in 1956 was as beautifully clear as anyone when he described self-concept as life being aware of itself. Many of the successes and failures that people experience in many areas of life are closely related to the ways that they have learned to view themselves and their relationships with others. It is also becoming clear that self-concept has at least three major qualities of interest to counselors, uh, psychologists, psychiat psychiatrists, not so much anymore, they just give you a prescription, but psychologists who try to analyze you uh, are more interested in this. And, they're referred to here as counselors. It's learned, it's organized, and it's dynamic, meaning it can change, okay? As far as we know, no one is born with a self-concept. It gradually emerges in the early months of life and is shaped and reshaped through repeated perceived experiences. The fact that self-concept is learned has some important implications. Because self-concept concept does not appear to be instinctive, but is a social product developed through experience, it possesses relatively boundless potential for development and actualization. Faulty thinking patterns, such as dichotomous reasoning, dividing everything in terms of opposites or extremes, a lot of people do that, or overgeneralizing, making sweeping conclusions based on little information, create negative interpretations of oneself. Self-concept is organized. Most researchers agree that self-concept has a generally stable quality that is characterized by orderliness and harmony. Each person maintains countless perceptions regarding one's personal existence, and each perception is orchestrated with all the others. It is this generally stable and organized quality of self-concept that gives consistency to the personality. This organized quality of self-concept has corollaries. Self-concept requires consistency. Stability tends to resist change. If self-concept changed readily, the individual would lack a consistent and dependable personality. You've seen people like that, okay? These people are all over the place, you know? They, they, they uh, uh, go up and down and around and change uh, and, and you can't, you know, you say, this person is, is psychotic or something, something wrong with this person. The more central a particular belief is to one's self-concept, the more resistant one is to changing that belief. At the heart of self-concept is the self as doer, the I, which is distinct from the self as object of various me's. This allows the person to reflect on past events analyze present perceptions and shape future experiences. Basic perceptions of oneself are quite stable. So change takes time. Rome, that's why psychologists make a lot of money. Rome was not built in a day and neither is self-concept. Perceived success and failure impact on self-concept. Failure in a highly regarded area, one that the individual highly regards, lowers evaluations in all other areas as well. If I'll give you the how this works, you're trying to uh, do something that's kind of difficult, and you just can't get it. You can't fix your phone. You can't fix your computer. You can't you can't build this workbench. You can't build whatever it happens to be, whatever it is. You're having difficulty with it, and 
and you uh, have to face the reality that you failed. What's, what do people usually say when that happens? I can't do anything right. Okay? Not, I can't fix my phone right. I can't fix my computer right. I can't uh, build a workbench or a range of flower uh, decoration, or whatever. They just say, I can't do anything right. So it lowers their evaluations in all areas. It becomes, uh, and if it happens uh, numerous times, then, it's, then that person becomes super depressed. I am a failure. I have no reason to live. And people become suicidal. Success in a prized area raises evaluations in other seemingly unrelated areas. Hey, well, I, I fixed my phone. Next, I'm going, to I'm going to tackle the television set that's broken. Okay? Or next, I'm going to fix my car. Okay? So when we, when we have success in a prized area, it improves our evaluations of our other aspects of life. Self-concept is dynamic. To understand the active nature of self-concept, it helps to imagine it as a gyro compass, a continuously active system that dependably points to the true north of a person's perceived existence. The guidance system not only shapes the ways a person uh, views oneself, others, and the world, but it also serves to, to direct action and enables each person to take a consistent stance in life. Rather than viewing self-concept as the cause of behavior, it is better understood as the gyro compass of human personality, providing consistency in personality and direction for behavior. The dynamic quality of self-concept also carries corollaries. The world and the things in it are not just perceived, they are perceived in relation to one self-concept. Now, do you see why I put it in the, in the sandbags? Okay. And I put it as number one in sandbag. Self-concept development is a continuous process. In the healthy personality, there is constant assimilation of new ideas and expulsion of old ideas throughout life. Individuals strive to behave in ways that are in keeping with their self-concepts, no matter how helpful or hurtful to oneself or others. Self-concept usually takes precedence over the physical body. Individuals will often sacrifice a physical comfort and safety for emotional satisfaction. Self-concept continuously guards itself against loss of self-esteem, for it is this loss that produces feelings of anxiety. If self-concept must constantly defend itself from assault, growth opportunities are limited. Okay, now we'll begin next hour by looking at the sub-structures uh, of self-concept. We'll do self-verification and couple more, uh, but we've already gone over almost 10 minutes. So let's pray. We'll take a break. Uh, oh, uh, if, you, if you look at the bottom of this slide, can you see what it says on the bottom of the slide? Galatians 2002, taught on January 29th, 2006. Okay, so what, tw uh, 17 years ago, okay? So, uh, but the thing that, uh, that I noticed was it was the Galatian study of 2002 and I was still doing the Galatian study in 2006. So four years that we had still spent on one book, uh, we may do that with Ephesians. So be aware. Mm -hmm. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the teaching ministry of the spirit. We're grateful for your word to be able to put things together, to be able to understand ourselves and the world around us. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just do five minutes. Come back quarter after.